Oh, you're going to be throwing some clips up there? Yeah, we throw some clips up. Um, I have the Bizarro tacked on opening somewhere. Let me see if I have <laughs> that, which is, I think, a good place to start. Cryptic opening. Yep, I have that. Uh, Gordon, when you have a chance, yes. you don't have to cough this time, but... Uh, Can you speak? Yeah, how's that sound? Sounding good. Do you mind... Yeah, how's that? Good? Oh, perfect. That sounds great. That good. All right. Everybody good. sounds good? Uh, no. Everybody sounds great. Great. Okay, Sounding and you have three good. tracks of audio recording. Three tracks of audio recording. All right. Whenever we have a third party, it gets very nerve-making. Oh, does that... Does well, that you know, we never we never really did it before this way. Yeah, so. we're not particularly technically Yeah, um, we're not technically adept. proficient. But, you know, we figure it, we figure it out. Uh, all right. I'm ready when... Chris, kick us ready? off with your full cast and crew open, will you? We are Jason and Chris, and we are full cast and crew. We present now this story full of mystery and intrigue and diapers and bandoliers, most ironical. It is in a seemingly inevitable fictional future, so none of these events will actually occur, since Sean Connery is now retired. And you poor creatures, who conjured you out of the clay? <laughs> is God in show business too? Spoiler. No, no, she gave that up years ago, and she's now a Reiki instructor who does two shifts a week at the Brooklyn Food Co-op. Good end. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Chris. My name is Jason, and we are here today to discuss Zardoz, a film so bizarre I will now give a brief description for those people who have not yet had the pleasure of experiencing this unique film. In the future as it is now comes a male Barbarella. His singlet doth protest too much under the girth of his haggis-like hanging ball and tackle. The most dangerous man in Hollywood had always been a director coming off a box office and critical success. In the eyes of the tabernacle in charge of the Hollywood vortex, you see this man, and it's usually a man, can do no wrong. One such man was English director John Borman, who, after three Oscar nods for 1972's squealingly successful Burt Reynolds' rafting gothic deliverance, could do as he wished to the lank, lifeless bodies of Hollywood's apathetics. And so, he did a second-level duty on it called Zardoz, a film about a futuristic band of immortals who, sure, get to live forever, but can't, alas, get it up or on. The immortals live in the vortex, some kind of floating mirror and inflatables fantasy land of batik garments and loosed breasts. In the forbidden sectors below them, slaves toil raising crops to make green bread and kill overpopulating Irish travelers at the behest of a floating tiki mug from the Hukilau Polynesian Restaurant and Lounge, also known as Zardoz. Into this fray steps Zed, a codpiece delivery system portrayed by a mid-career slumping Sean Connery. Much like a long psychedelic weekend at your mad rich uncle's country estate in the Cotswolds, much of what unfolds next involves the pursuit of lithe bodies around statuary, pretentious displays of knowledge, amateur acting, riding horses by torchlight, a visit to Thomas Dolby's She Blinded Me With Science video, and lots and lots and lots of breasts liberated from their restrictive garments. Zed introduces male sweat into the vortex, shatters some mirrors and illusions, destroys the crystal godhead and frees the immortals to the sweet release of death as he exposes Zardoz for the fraudulent huckster his headscarf and Disney's pirate adventure facial hair telegraphed him to be right from the beginning. And in the end, the two highest paid stars fuck in a cave to Beethoven. And in a poor man's version of 2001 Star Child mated to the Wizard of Oz, ashes to ashes, checks to checks, and then I looked up the definition of portmanteau. Eh, fini. Bravo! Now we're joined today by a special guest on the pod, friend of the pod, friend of mine, new to you, Chris, Gordon Ramsay. Welcome, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> uh, now, Gordon, a lot of people listening right now are probably surprised that you don't have an English accent. Yeah, it's that goddamn chef. Thing. I should probably <laughs> say that Gordon is also known as, no, not that Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> you share the name with the British chef, but you are not the British chef. You are, in my little description I have here now, you are a Staten Island-born former child actor, turned writer, content creator, stand-up comic, actor, Ethan Hawke stand-in, most recently on Paul Schrader's First Reformed. Wow. Former art handler, father, comic book obsessive collector of ephemera, pinball enthusiast, and motorcycle rider. Wow, you pretty much got it. We had Gordon come on today because uh, Gordon is one of those guys who has an encyclopedic recall of comic books, horror movies, rock music. And as I was talking to Gordon over the last few months and talking about the podcast, one word kept repeating, Zardoz. <laughs> Zardoz. Or as I it, like the movie. 
or as I would say in Sean Connery, Zardos. Now, Gordo, you might not be aware, but the comic styling of my description of the movie in no way uh, traditionally represents my actual opinions or feelings for the film. So I don't want you to think you're stepping into an arena where we're going to we're going to trash uh, an artifact as worthy of discussion as Zardos, because that is not the case. Oh, good. Yeah, I was afraid you were going in that direction. No, no. So um, when did you first encounter this unique and strange film? You know, that era of filmmaking, early 70s, is like no other. I was the perfect age for that. I was quite young. Back in 1974? 73. 73? There's a, there's a short list of films that affected me more than any others, and Zardoz is way up on top of that list. It's, uh, you know, these dreamlike films that, as a kid, it didn't need to make sense to me. It just, it just did. I just felt it. It was like a David Bowie song. You know, you, you feel what it's about. Yeah. And it was just the right kind of strange, you know, and the whole way it was laid out with the flashbacks to, are we doing spoilers here? Or? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Chris Chris and I spoil everything. We spoil everything. Even even things that aren't movies, even things that don't have stories. Doesn't matter. Just spoil them. Now, right. Gordon, um, in 1973, how old would you have been? In 73, I was seven. So I guess your parents had a pretty liberal policy regarding exposing you to Naked women. The movies that you that you, you you got to see back then were typically the 430 movie. You know, that's where I saw the whole uh, Planet of the Apes series. Mm-hmm. Omega Man, mm-hmm. Rollerball, things like that. Well, actually, Rollerball had not come out yet. With James Caan? Yes. Great movie. You know, Don't any, ask any Chris other. if he's seen it. He hasn't. You haven't? Oh. <laughs> that's another it. recurring so. trope on the podcast. Chris hasn't seen anything. I mean, it seems like just a smaller Death Sci-fi. Race 2000. Oh, the original one. Yeah, I haven't seen that in years. Rollerball is more of a social satire than a corporate kind of evil conglomerate film. Um, like yeah. he's forced into the sport and it's kind of like an idiocracy almost. Well, John Houseman is like the, you know, he's the corporate, he's the owner of the country. Right. Like the, 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 the of sure. the country? American yeah. corporation. Yeah, he's yeah. like yeah. this corporate president that... Yeah, the 430 version of Zardoz is like 15 minutes. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah I'm wondering, is it clearer or less clear? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing about this. I, I actually, I mean, I, I consider the movie to be a masterpiece. Of course. I, don't, I, just, it, I just love this movie. Yeah. Well, I, listen, I think that the movie, uh, I was thinking about this as we watch a lot of movies. And Zardoz in the... If it's discussed, it's discussed as sort of a, oh my God, you have to see how crazy and whacked out this movie is. And yet, when you look into like this era of films, science fiction films, there are so many movies that you've never heard of and never seen and never will hear of and will never see. For a movie to rise above all of that and have a place in the firmament is worthy of note. And Zardoz does have a lot of things going for it, not least of which, of course, knowing me, one of my main obsessions in life is the film 2001, A Space Odyssey, yeah. oh, which oh, okay. shares... Yeah, you've never heard I that? I didn't know that. <laughs> didn't know that? I didn't even know you'd seen it. It shares a cinematographer with Zardoz, Jeffrey Unsworth, photographed yes. both films. Anyway, let's start by showing a clip, which will be a little bit representative of what happened to the film after it was made. This is the way the film begins. I am Arthur Frayne, and I am Zardoz. I have lived 300 years, and I long to die, but death is no longer possible. I am immortal. I present now my story, full of mystery and intrigue, rich in irony, and most satirical. It is set deep in a possible future, so none of these events have yet occurred, but they may. In this tale, I am a fake, God by occupation, and a magician by inclination. I am the puppet master. I manipulate many of the characters and events you will see, but I am invented too for your entertainment and amusement. And you, poor creatures, who conjured you out of the clay, (laughs) is God in show business too. Borman was asked to to add this uh, because the studio felt that the film without it would be indecipherable. And with it, it's indecipherable. In fact, fact, I think it actually muddies things up because in the commentary track, he made it sound, and this might just be him being gentle, uh, Mm -hmm. it sounded that he was like, 
oh boy, maybe this is a bit much. Maybe if I tack this on at the front, it'll make it a little bit clearer. Mm, yeah. Either way, there are details in there that do make sense once you've seen everything else. In some ways, that should be at the back of the movie. He's got just so much stuff in there. I am more confused going into the actual action than I think I would have been if it had just started with, you know, men in diapers shooting at the Easter Island. In the commentary, he says that it, it tested where the, the audience was confused. So he said, so I thought what I'll do is I'll put this... I'll tack this on. And I wonder if he got any response from it from the audience after that. <laughs> Perfect. You, you yeah. nailed it. <laughs> yeah, did. I mean, it, they had already gone home by then. <laughs> <laughs> to me, what's the weirdest thing about this open is it just gives away the whole central conceit of the film you're about to watch. Yeah. And it robs the moment later on in the film where Zardoz is unmasked. It it. Oh, it, does that ruin it, the reveal? Then? Well, yeah. I mean, isn't the whole point that you're supposed to figure out at that moment that we're watching essentially a portmanteau of 2001 and The Wizard of Oz? Yes. But this just tells you that right away off the top. <laughs> he says, I'm a fake. You can't trust me. And I'm dead. Here, here's my tail. Like, yeah. With a mustache and beard drawn yes. on. A strange detail, which, again, there's so much going on oh, yeah, there. that I It all contributes it, it, to the whole milieu of it. Yeah. And I, I, whenever I see this, the part, a large part of me is an eight-year-old seeing it. That probably helps. <laughs> the logo also um, that you can see on the screen, it's reminiscent of like an automobile grill. I also thought it might be like a metal band. Yes. Like a high school oh. metal band. I actually have an idea for, I'm, I've been trying to push a Broadway musical Zardoz for years now. And, uh, and nobody's biting? I, I mean, well, that's because we haven't recorded this yet. This I'm sure will this will be the, get out to a lot of potential yeah. investors. We get a lot of uh, Broadway insiders. This will open the floodgates. Well, I could get Charlie. You know, Charlie Borman is right. Yeah, Charlie, is he related to he's, John Borman? He's John Borman's son. He's, he's the one that does the around. motorcycle yeah. documentary with you and McGregor. Those are great. And so I'm going to run it past. You really want to do a staged musical version of Zardoz? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm with you, I think it's great. More I power to you, Gordo. One of the one of the great things about the film is the haunting image of the floating head. Yeah. It's simple, but it has a real power yeah. and a presence. The floating head is the means by which Zardoz communicates to the Brutals in Sector 4, I believe we are. Uh, is it Vortex 4? No, the Vortex is where the Immortals live. Well, yeah, but, but there's, where the, there, there are where the Brutals ones. live right. is, well, they're is the outlanders. in a sector, Outland sector. Yeah, right. they live outside of yes. the Vortex, but I think that was the nearest Vortex that they were outside. Right, of. Greater Metro Vortex 4. So where yeah. the Brutals are, the horse-riding Brutals, of which Sean Connery is one, that's a, that's a Vortex. No, the yeah. Vortex is is the place where the Immortals, you have to break through a barrier. There are these kind of different Vortex neighborhoods. Right, I think so sort of like the land surrounding the Vortex is almost like the suburbs of the Vortex which is where the Brutals live, and the Exterminators, the guys in red. Well, an Exterminator is also a Brutal. Yeah, that's right, yes. He's been elevated. And given, because uh, you talk about how arresting that image of the, the flying uh, head is, it becomes even more so when you see the Exterminators actually wearing Zardoz masks. I'm amazed that I've never seen uh, those on Halloween. One of the other great things, so in my in my intro, I was referencing that the most dangerous man in Hollywood is is a director coming off a critical and box office success because historically, that is the one moment you could do whatever the fuck <laughs> you want. Yeah. And some of the greatest, weirdest, most bizarre things come from that moment in a director's career. Jason, this is John Borman's Roma. <laughs> Think of it that way. This is uh, the movie John Borman wanted to make. And also what's great about it is he did the whole thing around his house. Yeah. So he was living Easy in the me, Irish yeah. countryside at the and time. <laughs> and he basically brilliantly said, I want to make this movie. Everything is going to happen within 10 miles of my home. I'm going to live in my home while I'm making the film. Uh, he, his own family appears in the movie. Yeah. And the extras uh, appearing throughout the film are Irish travelers, mm -hmm. alternately known as tinkers, I believe. He says that they were the greatest group of extras he'd ever worked with, uncomplaining, showed up on time, had good cheer. Here's a scene uh, that we're going to play a little bit of where Zardoz, who communicates to the Brutals and the Exterminators uh, through the giant floating mask, uh, has come down to deliver an important message. Zardoz speaks to you. You have been raised up from brutality to kill the brutals who multiply. To this end, Zardoz, your god, gave you the gift of the god. 
The gun is good. The gun is good! The penis is evil. This is the part where the two studio executives look at each other. <laughs> the gun, oh, what, what did he shit. say? <laughs> but the gun shoots death and purifies the earth of the filth of brutals. Zardoz has spoken. The Brutals are fighting over a cache of weapons and shotguns and shells that are that pour out of the mouth of Zardoz. This could have been a film production where they said, let's go out and film one movie, but in fact, we're going to film four distinct movies. One, we're going to film, yeah, John, whatever John Barman's thing is he wants to do. That's great. We're going to do that. <laughs> Two, we're going to get a hardcore porn movie, a 1972 hardcore pornography movie that we're going to be able to sell around the world. Three, um, you know, uh, some kind of a creature film or a monster movie. Um, and four, like some psychedelic uh, light, like backlit movie projections for like, you know, acid parties. Yeah. And you can mm-hmm. accomplish all that with this one shoot. Um, so from there, the plot then is unfolded to us whereby we meet Zed, played by Sean Connery, who is one of the brutals who's turned into an exterminator and who... Maybe you guys understand how he ended up inside the floating head because I watched it twice and there, that to me was never explained. Did I miss that? They go back and they show how he and his brutal friends uh, covered him up in grain. Or yeah. Th- why mean, is there grain inside still, the floating head? I, because they come to get the harvest. That's yeah. the, oh, okay, There's been okay. a change in mission. Instead yeah. of oh, right. the exterminators exterminating the other brutals, it's like- They're going to grow crops. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. New rules. <laughs> You hear, ever hear the expression, beat your swords into plowshares? Yeah. It's sort of like that, but with sort guns, of like that. the exterminators don't really like farming because they like killing. They've been sort of raised up to yeah, do that yeah, and that give, made that as their meaning. And so this is a revolutionary act. Uh, they're like, all right, you with the biggest mustache, you gonna, you're going to stow away in the head and that's how you'll get inside the vortex and find, and then let the rest of us in, and we're going to destroy it. And is the propulsion mechanism of the floating head ever explained in any way? The Wizard of Oz thing, which I get, uh, but the fakery does not extend to the floating head, which is some form of futuristic, mystical, magical propulsion, I guess. And the, the gathering of the grain and the crops is used by the immortals whom Zed then encounters to make the green bread. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Okay. You're saying that if they can, if they have the power to make a, a floating head, then they should just be able to kind of manifest green bread without any labors or anything like well, that? Well, I mean, if you want to start picking it apart, Gordon, you could say that, two, what are we, 200 years into the future? Closer to from three. From the present day, yeah, 300 years. Yeah, it's Yet we're still using shotguns uh, and eating bread and fruits. Yeah. Even though nice we don't now blend. have to sleep or procreate uh, or die. But we still like our bread. And uh, Borman says that the reason Sean Connery ended up in this picture was because coming off the most recent James Bond film, which I think might have been 69 or 71. 71, yeah. uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Diamonds Are Forever. That he was having a hard time finding work. It's hard for us now. So much time has passed in Sean Connery's career that we think of him, yes, as James Bond, but we know enough of his other roles, Ramius and Hunt for Red October, The Untouchables, that now it's probably easy to forget that at the time, he was probably very typecast as sure. James yeah, Bond. Yeah, he was too close to the, to the uh, Bond era. Brilliantly, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think, the original star for the picture was supposed to be Burt Reynolds, yes. which I could really see. Sure. That would have been a totally different Mustache, vibe yeah. on there. Would it? <laughs> there would have been all that Burt Reynolds swagger. It was, it was a whole different thing than, than Sean Connery. You know? But on the other hand, both of them are very like overtly- Macho? Sur- male. Macho, yeah. Yeah, they are each other's word. counterpart, I think. But I think, you know, there's a Scottish version versus a, I don't, I don't know where Burt Reynolds is from, but certainly Florida, man. American yeah. version. Florida, that's right, yeah. Connery- does embody that sort of like mustachioed testosterone. Um, But he also embodies a sly intelligence, which works with the character Zed, because we come to find out Zed isn't just the knuckle dragging exterminator. for 1973 Zardoz. That we're led to believe. (laughs) Burt Reynolds would have a earthier, less intelligent Zed. Yeah, I'd I'd picture him like as a gum chewing, you know, spitting. (laughs) Burt Reynolds had just come off uh, Deliverance. Yeah. So Borman says 
that the reason Burt Reynolds couldn't be in the film was he fell sick, which is Hollywood for he read the script. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Conversely, I'm sure Sean Connery had many reasons for doing it, but I'm sure- He had 200,000 reasons for well, doing it. Also, well, I mean, that wasn't a lot for him, though. Oh, well, that's a lot in 1973 dollars. I mean, the way grand? Borman describes it is that we could only pay him yeah. that, and he still did it because he wanted to. He does say that, yeah. But well, I think he does have money. a lot. There is somebody who has a line that looks at him and says, "You are obviously superior in every way to all of us here, <laughs> and you could totally destroy us. We have to destroy you because you're so much better than us." You must know that you're mentally and physically vastly superior to me or anyone else here. And I think that was a big part of uh, the character that he created. It was a much diff- more difficult to talk him into that wedding dress. Another uh, actor that was offered the lead role of Zed uh, prior to it becoming Sean Connery was Richard Harris. John Borman says, Harris never responded, <laughs> which is another good Hollywood tactic for, <laughs> for avoiding the work you don't necessarily want to do for whatever reason. One of the great frequently asked questions on the IMDb page is very straightforward. I'll read it to you. It says, question, I don't understand this movie. What is it about? Can you answer that question for this listener, Gore? I believe I can. To me, it's, I mean, there have been movies like this where scientists try to control nature and they get their asses whipped by Mother Nature in Mm -hmm. in whatever crafty way that Mother Nature Mm -hmm. devises to do that. In this case, cultivating this superior brutal to penetrate and fuck the whole thing up. The superior brutal is made specifically to destroy it. It's spoiler more- alert. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert for 1973 Zardoz. That's the scene at the end of the film with the old guy on the deathbed. Is he the guy that created yeah, yeah, the idea the- of the immortals? Uh-huh. Well, he's one of all of the renegades. Yeah, they're all. They were the group of scientists that they flash back okay. and they oh, say, they "We shall like never destroy ourselves, even if we want to." But then the the regular right. Eternals are their children and grow up to be sort of decadent and become nihilistic because all meaning is taken away from them because they can't die, they don't work, they sort of just have nothing going on. And so they sort of curdle and become this this nihilistic society, the worst of which being, or I don't know if you took the word, uh, Zardoz himself, because he does breed this super brutal to destroy all of this. I have to say, I this is my favorite kind of movie because it is about so much and it doesn't always work and it doesn't completely hang together, but like the sincerity and the true belief, and you can even hear it in John Borman now or whenever he recorded the DVD commentary, like he kind of believe, it's not that he believes it, he hasn't drawn any conclusions, but he's like, and I want to do this and I want to talk about the differences in generations and I want to talk about class struggle and I want to talk about this yeah, and I mean, there are too many guns. Like, and it's I just appreciate hot- him taking the shot, you know? Yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Here's I mean, a clip that that speaks to a little bit of what they were trying to do in in creating this structuring the society the way they did. They did it. They were the scientists, the best in the world, but they were middle-aged, too conditioned to mortality. They went renegade. We were their offspring, and we were born into vortex life. Death is banished forever. I direct that the tabernacle erase from us all memories of its construction so we can never destroy it. Here, man, and the sum of his knowledge will never die, but go forward to perfection. We applied ourselves to the unsolved mysteries of the universe. But even with infinite time and the help of the tabernacle, our minds were not up to it. We failed. It's also the elitist allegory. You know, he was talking about, uh, was it H.G. Wells? No, it was was the acid head guy. uh, Oh, Aldous Huxley. Huxley, yeah. Of just the disaster. You know, I don't know if you ever looked into the mystery school stuff. You ever listen to William Cooper? He's like the, the king of all conspiracy guys. He wrote this book, Behold a Pale Horse. Well, it goes way back to Pythagoras. And then, you know, this, he, it almost reminds me of these, this group of scientists where Pythagoras, you know, he had these secrets. And he said, and he had his own version of the Brutals and he didn't want to share his knowledge with them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, an allegory for the classist, the, the, the disaster of having, you know, conceiving of human beings as two different species, pretty much. Right. And it's very English as well, the class system the repressed sexuality. Borman says, you know, I wondered what happens if you remove sexuality from a society? What happens um, if you remove the need to procreate what occurs? Yeah. What I I didn't understand, I understand why the scientists set up the vortex and the immortals, but I 
I couldn't follow who birthed Zed so that Zed could destroy what he eventually destroyed. Zardoz. This was Zardoz's plan. He picked. He picked Zed. He picked. Well, he picked Zed's parents, parents. even right. to like okay. breed right. But, him. But then Zed tells him that you know he's looked into the into the face of the thing that influenced Arthur Frayn. Yeah. And so right. When you say Zardoz, you mean Arthur Frayn. Arthur yeah. Frayn, who yes. is the the man behind the wizard mask. Right. So Arthur Frayn created Zed in order to destroy his own construction of society? He was prompted to do so by whatever this force That crystal was. force. Right. Which I think is like an artificial intelligence of some kind. Wait, but isn't that crystal thing the, the <laughs> tabernacle? Yeah, but I mean, and at some I, point, it, mm-hmm. it must have been taken over by Mother Nature. I mean, that, that's the whole thing, is that they say, well, you try to go against Mother Nature, and this is what happens. Oh, but I, th- I thought that was once you created Zed... Like he is the sort of natural thing. Maybe I was too lost in the trippiness of it. I thought when Zed says, I have looked into the force that made you do this, I thought he was being a little bit more poetic than that, that he was like, just by the learning that I have had by through these experiences, I now understand why you wanted to destroy your own, uh, your parents' creation. This clip may help explain Uh, things. Ah, yes. Tell me about the crystal transmitter. I cannot give information which may threaten my own security. Plane emissions refract low wavelength laser light passing through the crystal in the brain. They are a code sent to you for interpretation and storage. A receiver must be like a transmitter. I think you're a crystal. In fact, this one, this diamond. In here, there is infinite storage space for refracted light patterns. Yes or no? You have me in the palm of your hand. Already you have learnt to see my light wavelengths in the diamond. Now you will try to erase the refractions and destroy me. Your aim is to destroy me, isn't it? Yes. I am the sum of all these people and all their knowledge. Would you destroy us and all that we are? Yes. Would you not rather be part of us, joined Joined to us, us. a light shining shining to the future, future. love Love us, us. cherish Cherish the truth? truth. So that honestly clears it all up. I don't want to be too hard. Well, I mean, it's the collective. It's the last temptation of Christ. I mean, that's Satan tempting uh, Jesus. So all the collective knowledge of the Eternals has gathered and collected itself in this artificial intelligence, which much like every artificial intelligence and much like what will eventually happen here within months or years, the, what do they call it? The reckoning, the- The a singularity. The singularity. Right. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, the transhumanism. This, this is kind of a precursor. It's that, a precursor. Yeah. So that's what I think they're getting at. But and, I don't think the tabernacle says that it's run amok. No. I think the thing is saying like infinite storage space of all the knowledge going in, but it also serves as a transmitter. So I think it's saying that knowledge- sort of can be free and builds that you can't truly segregate it or it becomes stunted, which is, I think, what happened to the Eternals more so than the crystal. Sounds good to me. Well, so is the, is the crystal represent, is that the suicidal collective unconscious? Or yeah. is it the Hegelian central storm at the heart of all mankind? Well, I mean, th- th- that's two words for the same thing. Well, why say the same thing once when you can say <laughs> it twice? You can say it twice, absolutely. The brilliance of the screenplay is you could, every sentence is, it could be played forwards or backwards. It's it, every sentence says the contradiction of its own self. Yeah, it's perfect. It's so none of the acting is actually reacting to anything that happened before or after. Yeah. It is its own pure <laughs> yes. line reading. I kept expecting him to say, well, I was really, really high, you see. Yes, John Borman's commentary track is brilliant in that it's kind of like having a cup of tea with your doddering aunt in the English countryside. And to Chris's earlier point, he doesn't seem to have many deep thoughts about what was actually going on. He does say, I was interested in this theme. I was interested in the theme of what happens if we can live forever and we don't need to procreate. So he mentions and references those themes, but in the actual commentary itself, it's it's very much sort of a collection of, oh yes, and this is some Perspex glasses we shot. (laughs) The work speaks for itself. I think it's all pretty clear. I even added that prologue to make it clearer. What don't you want? I mean, it's all pretty much laid out. I'm not sure. There's a wagon right there. There's a brutal. (laughs) I mean, what do you want? 
Uh, doesn't it make you want to make a, a science fiction movie that, that you have no intent, like there's really no intent <laughs> at all? You just have other people attach meaning to it? Full Cast and Crew is brought to you by Two Different Guys on a Bench, a new comedy series from American Vandal star Ryan O'Flanagan. Two Different Guys on a Bench, where Ryan talks to Ryan on a bench. We keep the comedy simple, folks. Two Different Guys on a Bench videos can be found now on Facebook at Chuckler Comedy. Like and follow Chuckler for the latest and greatest short form comedy videos. Chuckler, original comedy delivered daily. One of the great things about this movie is these scenes where Sean Connery becomes captive to a group of immortals who are a female dominant society, by the way. There's another interesting aspect of the movie. There is a triangle set up between. I think it's May Consuela. May Consuela. Consuela. Of course it's Consuela. Listen, I love Charlotte Rampling, and as far yeah. as I'm concerned, she could play anything except a person named Consuela. <laughs> 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 it's just part of the disjointing. Uh, yeah, I was just, that's quality. the one thing about this movie that I didn't buy. The right off the, the bat. naming of her character, character Venezuela. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's basically the most English of roses. Yes. Um, and did you hear what she said about about Connery? She was looking forward yes. to getting raped by him. Let's be fair. That John Borman, who sounds like a very nice man, has a few quips in this director's commentary, which are a little out of date. And, yes. and his telling of how Charlotte Rampling was looking forward to her love scene with Sean Connery yes. in his telling, he unfortunately uses the terminology that you just quoted. And it it it, it jars the ear. When is the first time that they... When they make the baby. But in, this, once they've left the whole rest of the society, or is it when they're in the vortex? No, no, it's when they're in the cave. Because I had the impression that there might have been something before... Well, there's tension. There's tension, but they don't actually, he doesn't grab her in the same way that he grabs the apathetic. No, which uh, is a weird fucking is, yeah. scene, which I guess is meant to indicate the animal-like nature of the brutals. Absolutely. Yeah, and of him as a sort of, of male figure. Again, yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely questionable things, certainly looking at it now and probably even looking at it, certainly even looking at it then, especially the idea that one of the apathetics takes the sweat Yes. Yeah. Which I initially thought was a tear, which I thought was a little overly too, romantic. Yeah. But it, but from said sweat from him, and that yes. sort of revitalizes them mm -hmm. as if the idea being like apathetic people in culture or layabout youths just need a little bit of good old fashioned brutality. Brutality and, yeah. and sort of manliness as the, as the way that it's um, portrayed here to sort of give them a new lease on life. And that new lease on life, of course, includes killing people. And then having an orgy. I mean, that really jazzes them up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, they really, yeah, they go from zero to 60 in nothing, in no time at all. This scene is a brilliant indication of what you're just talking about because the immortals have lost the ability to have any sensuality or need for procreation or sex. So now that Zed is their captive, he is ostensibly an object of study. Mm -hmm. And both May and in this scene, Consuela, who is totally against the idea of studying Zed, but now suddenly Consuela is is happy to lead this uh, sexuality seminar. Well, so after failing to be turned on by uh, showering breasts and some sort of mud wrestling, Zed is turns his attention to Consuela, and then the audio parallelogram really starts bouncing around in the old box, and he. Uh, he sports a woody. Yes, he does. And in, and in doing so, brings down an entire society. This brutal, like other primates living unselfconscious lives, is capable of spontaneous and reflexive erection. As part of May's studies of this creature, we're trying to find once again the link between erotic stimulation and erection. This experiment will measure autoerotic stimulation of the cortex, leading to erection. Play. The tracer indicates that this image is not erotically stimulating to the brutal. Change. This doesn't seem to affect him either. <laughs> Consuela's done the trick herself. <laughs> But the parallelogram does seem, uh, you know, the whole thing about a- It's biofeedback, man. This was the 70s. This was but a I mean, deal. 
they could see if you got an <laughs> erection. They don't need to. It's not like a heartbeat, like no, to, to, to check and make sure. It's like there is an external manifestation that presumably they saw. But also, why are they doing extensive studies in this area before Zed even arrives? I thought they were. I thought they. I mean, they already know everything. They have the sum total of the Earth's knowledge contained in their. Vortex libraries. Yeah, but it's been a while. And there were some disagreements. <laughs> May was like this other team that wanted to. Yeah. You know, she has her own renegade ideas. You well, know, May it? and Charlotte Rampling are very good. The actors that play both of those characters yes. are, I mean, Charlotte Rampling obviously is, is great. Um, the actor who plays. I love Friend. Friend is, I think he's one uh, of my friends. favorites. Friend, what is that actor's name? I had that. Uh, that uh, John Borman describes as a very good television character actor. Talk about damning yeah. faint praise <laughs> in his in his British way, which sort of implies you're not a very good actor. Right. Yeah, like, and he can carry his own weight. He's fairly broad and, and, and histrionic in most scenes. You don't need to do a bit of directing. Just sort of let him go and one gets it all on the just screen. Just wind him up. And yeah. Friend suffers uh, an ignominious end. Such a great scene. They, they're gathered around a mirrored table and they decide to go to level two, which is where they communicate and meditate at a nonverbal level collectively. And Friend, for reasons perhaps you understand, I don't, he chooses not to go meet them at that meditative level. I think they're discussing whether to keep Zed alive or not. Yes, they're voting. Yeah. And I have to... <laughs> They have two voting scenes in this. I expected either just shake your head yes or no. They each have their own little flirt. They each have their own thing. thing. Yeah. And I was, I was like, <laughs> they have like 30 different hand signals. I think we should adopt this system of voting in the States. I think it would cover a lot of voter fraud that we otherwise well, are suffering say, I from. I think they tried it in Florida in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, the gestures, but then some of them are just yeah, like, they're like, nope, mm. no. Yeah, so that was perfectly clear, but this, I don't know what this. Vote. Yeah, vote. Yeah. Give your votes. May has been given seven days to complete her study. Then Zed will be terminated. Oh, <laughs> The monster is a mirror. And when we look at him, we look into our own hidden faces. Meditate on this at second level. I will not go to second level, no. no I will not be one mind with you. I know what May wants with Zed. No! The Vortex is an obscenity. I know. I hate all women. Birth. Fertility. Superstition. Friend is beyond redemption. No. No. Renegade. Renegade. Friend doesn't want to meditate on the second level with that. I'm not sure why. But I think because both with May, with Friend, with that guy, Satan, I think is his name. <laughs> the other guy that is on trial that they're voting oh, George? on. George. 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 George Satan. Really? No, uh, didn't George Satan. <laughs> Forgive me. George Satan. Satan. There is discontent within this generation, most definitely with Frame. Well, it's I mean, always this men. Is why Frame does this something. The two men oh, are discontented. I, well, no, but I, I think May also has a certain amount of discontent, which is why she's attracted to and wants to study Zed. Well, you know, and then, yeah, and then um, uh, Consuela sort of comes across that way as well. Yeah, she tries to fight it for a long time. Well, yeah. Consuela is hot and heavy for Zed from scene one. We can all see that. And her resistance to him is patently because of her attraction to him. And sure. as, as she says in, the, in another thrilling bit of line reading, I, I become you. Or he oh, says- In hunting you, I have become you. Yes. <laughs> what does that mean? And then he does that Nietzsche quote. The hunt is always better than the kill. In hunting you, I have become you. I have destroyed what I set out to defend. He who fights too long against dragons becomes a dragon himself, Nietzsche. To me, that seems like what the whole thing is about because she, why she wants to reject him and not have him around is because she knows allowing these ideas into the vortex are going to ruin their equilibrium. You know, what about our yes. equilibrium, I think some point says. Yes. So that's why she's fighting it. And it's the other people that are sort of giving up that fight and letting these things come into this society. Mm, so even right. with, you know, 
in some ways, I think this is meant to be an inevitable ending, that a society like this could not survive because nature will out in the form of this ponytail and mustache. I mean, Friend is kind of like a punk, punk rock. You know, he's just like, fuck you. I'm an, I'm an individual. I don't want to join your collab. He says at that moment he chooses. He's so sick of it. Yeah. That yeah. he doesn't give a shit, whatever. He's going to become, um, he's going to go renegade. Because man's idea of, of social perfection is always a bad thing. Well, listen, this is what I always say to Chris. I'm for the robot apocalypse, <laughs> okay? I am for your refrigerator attacking and killing you in the midst I, of the evening. That's what the tabernacle is. If you're lucky, you end up as Consuela. If you're not lucky, you end up as Friend. Friend, who shout out to the uh, makeup people, because I don't know if you've looked on his IMDb page, John Alderton, who plays Friend, uh, when they made up half his face oh, to yeah. age, yeah, it was like they got it like victim. exactly right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they really. So uh, <clears throat> they, they really could see the future. Oh, you know, you did. You guys, you ever see that movie Demon Seed? No. Oh, uh, that's another one from that era. Uh huh. Dystopian um, computer run amok. What's the seed? Uh, the seed code impregnated into sperm so that demon babies will pretty much run yeah. amok across the earth. Oh, yeah, Julie creates- Christie. I, I'm not going to say anything about. It. You got to see that movie. An you organic supercomputer with artificial intelligence which becomes obsessed with human beings. And one in particular. Her name yeah. is Julie Christie. And in particular, the creator's wife. Yes. <laughs> in particular, in the nude. Good. Yeah, that was a great one. That really brought out the little pervert in me. There's a lot of <clears throat> nudity in this era of filmmaking. And, um, you know, I guess in, in the way in what, this is 1973. I was at my cough. Is that good for you? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Could you do one more just a little louder? <laughs> <clears throat> Perfect. This is also, even though it's 1973, culturally, we are very much still in the 60s. Um, It's a very conservative movie in its own way because it's sort of, I mean, isn't the takeaway of the film that once you introduce sexuality and desire, everything goes to shit? I don't know. I think in some ways that the original sin is trying to Trying to eliminate not, nature to eliminate from that. nature. It's like humans are, okay. are humans. But you're, I think you're right because I was also thinking this plays a lot like um, Planet of the Apes in yes. terms of the the false god and right. sort of the, the lies about the society that uh, has been created and um, sort of bumping up against the end of that. Two other interesting Sean Connery facts. When Sean Connery won an Oscar for The Untouchables, which is a pretty funny over-the-top movie of, yeah. the, of the 80s or 90s whenever it came out, I didn't realize this until I heard John Borman say it that Sean Connery is such a presence and we so buy into him that we forget that he won an Oscar for playing an Irish cop with a Scottish <laughs> accent. And I never even occurred to me until he said that. Everything in the movie is, is about how Irish this guy is. Right. And he's speaking in the thickest Scottish brogue the entire time. Never even occurred to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Sean Connery. <laughs> Just accept he's Sean Connery. He's Sean Connery. Part, that's, listen, he also played a Russian, famously. Uh, oh, he played a great Russian. <laughs> he played a great Russian, yeah. I think Sean Connery is a great film actor. He, 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 he understands and commands the medium. He has an intrinsic ability to subtly play to the camera and also embody all of those qualities without really over-verbalizing no, anything. No, it's never, just as present, all about presence. Tells you anything. As an actor, he's always just the embodiment of the thing that's going on in the scene, and it reads so clearly. There's a confidence, uh, self-possession yeah. that he has that is that is truly remarkable. And actually, just one last thing about him being John, uh, John, about him being John, about him being Bond, looking back, we now know his whole career this seems like such a perfect role for him because what made him such a good Bond was he had a certain amount of suaveness, Mm -hmm. but it was on top of this part of him that that you see in this and in in later movies in a way that Roger Moore, wonderful as he was in in other ways, it was a different kind of maleness and sexuality than uh, than than Sean Connery had. It just it was it, it wasn't as believable with him, was it? Well, Roger Moore's Bond was a more winking, yeah, it was a bit dudging, campy, yeah. campy. I mean, it has its own mer- it has its own merits, and, yes. and and I enjoy watching them. But I mean, if you want real Bond, you got to go to the early Sean Connery Bonds. Another interesting thing about Sean Connery was he was offered the role of Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings film series, and he declined it because of, quote, not understanding the script. He apparently (laughs) did also not understand that he would have been offered 15% of the worldwide box office, which could have earned him as much as $400 million. No, I don't under I don't understand, I don't understand this. I've been burned once by doing a script <laughs> that I didn't quite understand. John Borman gave me a script that I didn't understand, and I said yes. <laughs> it's a job for you, anything. 
But you know what? He's good in this movie, and the movie does have a certain kind of consistency and logic to itself, so that even watching it now, it's so patently ridiculous in so many ways. It holds together. It is about the things John Borman wanted it to be about, yeah. even if it requires a level of attention to the dialogue, which all the other attributes of a film don't sustain. Yes. So I find it almost impossible to follow what's going on because my eye is so interested in what's going on on the screen, which the eye candy is so good and so bizarre that I'm just looking at like, wow. But the dialogue, like when we play it or when we read what's being said. It's almost too subtle, too hard boiled <laughs> down to its essence so that it loses rather, I guess, like the uh, the society of the Eternals. Like it's lost the human stuff. And somebody's like, look, this is the problem. Nobody gets yeah, elections anymore. Guys, what's, this is what's yeah, going yeah. on here. <laughs> but it, it's unable to do that. So it's a little bit too highfalutin. Uh, though um, so good. he talked about how uh, they were on a very limited budget which especially yes. for a science fiction thing is always tough. And yet I think because of the cinematography, but also shooting it on film as opposed to digital, it doesn't look cheap. There's something about the physical landscape and the fact that it's always kind of gloomy in mm -hmm. England mm -hmm. and the graininess that makes anything look real. Yes. Well, uh, here's- It was shot in Ireland, wasn't it? It was shot, it was shot in Ireland, all within 10 miles of John Borman's house. Did I say England? Yeah. Wickham or something like that. This is another scene I'll just play for you briefly, which is- um, introduces the concept of touch teaching, which I think all of us as young grade schoolers in the 70s would have been much more interested in than the rote learning we were subjected to. How much time do we have? We will not work in time. You will take our knowledge by osmosis, out of time. We will touch teach you, and you will give us your seed. 75 plus, where it is assumed that E75 equals R of L75. R being the ratio of the term Contradictions exist everywhere. You get the idea. You're basically learning by having a naked woman crawl all over your body <laughs> while films are projected upon both of your bodies. And rather than doing anything annoying like reading books and stuff, yeah. you, long. you absorb the knowledge through the light touch of the nipples, I guess. Mm -hmm. And awesome. all that done in real time on the set, it's, be it's beautifully shot. Well, it looks yeah. great. Did you hear the part about where he's, he's talking about this one guy who hated the film? But he said, well, there was this touch teaching part, which if you want to go see that, oh, it yeah. happens at exactly this point during the film. He gave the time so that you could show up at the theater just so you could see yeah. that scene. Um, which in 73, I guess the movie was like 250 or something. It was not oh, it's probably if that. Two, two bits. Bucks. What is two bits anyway? It's either cents. four quarters or, no, no, it's two, What's a bit? two quarters. I guess half of a quarter. Two bits. An eighth. How do you know? Oh, only because I've heard two bits and then somebody gets a quarter. Oh, really? Well, wait. Shave and a When you're talking cut. two bits, quarters didn't exist. Probably. Really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> probably, but possibly. It's like two <laughs> chunks well, of silver. Wait, when did money get invented? I mean, uh, like coin th money. <laughs> coin money? Well, that goes way back. Wait, no, I'm saying, wait, this is a serious question. In the 20s, we had dimes and nickels and quarters. I think so, yeah. Okay. Made yeah, out yeah. of silver. What else about Zardoz? I mean, I've, you know, you, you can both say... Anything and nothing about Zardoz. It's, there really is no apt, succinct description of it all. You, you really just have to see it yeah. and appreciate it for what it is and was. Sean Connery does do a great job, for the most part. <laughs> Filling out that singlet? Filling out that singlet um, and that bandolier. And uh, he's great, except there is my favorite scene. There's at one point where I guess they first go into the laboratory, which is this the uh, glass pyramid oh, yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. walking up to it and uh, Sean Connery goes up to it and then he, he has to like mime as if he's <laughs> falling <laughs> and he is uh, he's like, not I a gifted mime they must have done that just after the like scene where he had to do a wedding dress he was like I am not putting any effort into this John Borman is like calls it out he's like oh yeah he does some he does <laughs> very nice acting here I was like eh. That's where he just kind a little of, overly Whoa. general. Yeah. It's like a high school play. Yeah. I'm falling into the triangle. <laughs> and he doesn't even bother like bending his knees. Like, <laughs> I'm not doing another take. Well, that's well, extra dimensional acting. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a lot of Lecoq involved in this film, but Jacques right. Lecoq was not one of them. Jo <laughs> Jacques Lecoq. Yeah, he's the father of modern mime, Gordo. Oh, of course. Well, the enemy of clowning. The in enemy of clowning? Oh. oh, yes. That's good. Mime is the enemy of clowning. Is there, a, is there a factional war between mimes and clowns? What there's a been a silent for war Romeo and Juliet. 
Has anyone done Shakespeare that way? Because I think you're onto something. I would I would drop this <laughs> yeah, whole Zardoz funny. musical <laughs> thing, and I would go into mime clown war. So one of the great things about the end is, um, again, in this kind of post-2001 universe that we were living in when this film came out, there is an attempt to essentially, now we're going to see the cycle of life reborn. And when Zed and Consuela consummate their cave love, and she immediately becomes fully pregnant and gives birth to a child, and then there's a rapid aging scene mm -hmm. where they're holding hands, and they go from them as we know them to skeletons to a right. pile of well, the dust. The kid goes off to college. The kid goes off to college, <laughs> rides motorcycles with Ewan McGregor, like goes on to a whole life, right? So apparently the aging makeup was so elaborate, and as he kind of hilariously describes Sean Connery a few times as being a little persnickety about having things touch his skin. So they shot this whole scene, which took an entire day. And then when they got the film back, there was a flaw in the film stock. They had to do the whole scene a second time. And he said, Sean was just apoplectic, even in a rage at the idea of having to do this entire makeup thing and a second time. After the second time- It was like after the rap party. It was after party. the rap party and everyone was hung over and the assistant cameraman exposed the film by opening the back of the camera and ruined the entire second take and they had to do it a third yeah. time. And Borman has a hilarious story where like, many years later at a Los Angeles Starbucks. Well, cause he said that that assistant who did that yeah. left the country. Yeah. Left the country. Because he was like, well, Sean Woody was very, very enraged and he wanted to kill the, uh, the camera assistant and uh, he had to be restrained. You yeah. Know? I would not want to have crossed Sean Connery. No. I mean, he left the country out of fear for his life. <laughs> and then like 25 years later, runs into John Borman in an LA coffee shop and says, you don't remember me, do you? And John Borman says, no, I don't. I'm just the guy who exposed the film. He's now a DP for commercials in Los Angeles. I think Angeles he even said now. like, oh, I'm so glad you don't remember me yeah. because. <laughs> it's like, that's a good thing. Well, that's how Zardoz ends, although it doesn't really end, does it? Because it, nothing ever does. Nothing ends. It, it begins, all begins again, again yes. doesn't it? In the distant future. Full Cast and Crew is brought to you by Out of Jack's Mind, a new comedy short video series from Jack Plotnick, co-writer and director of the Sony Pictures feature film Space Station 76, and current recurring guest on Grace and Frankie and Z Nation. Out of Jack's Mind, like and follow at Chuckler Comedy on Facebook or Chuckler.com. Chuckler, original comedy delivered daily. Um, well, let's move on to our other segments. Chris, are you ready to do Rants and Raves? I sure am. Go ahead. I'll start with a, with a rave or two. The first one is, do you guys hear about Grace Slick? Grace Slick had licensed a Jefferson Starship. Yeah, let me make sure. Isn't that I... Grace Slick dead? No, she's not. She lives in the canyon. I was hanging out with her daughter China last Friday night after seeing a Jefferson Starship show. Wait a minute, this what? This is the second time <laughs> I saw the same show. Did you guys set this up nine years ago? <laughs> and uh, you were hanging out with China Slick Kantner. Yeah, and there's was well, only one. Actually, there's two dudes from the Starship that are still alive. One guy was eighty. But he he could still he could still it do out. it. Oh yeah, Marty Ballin is gone. <laughs> He's he is a goner. Chris doesn't know any. Uh, and, Chris doesn't have any idea what we're talking about. He's not a music guy. No, I mean I did research. Well, we a met Paul bit, Kantner apparently. last time nine years ago. Paul Kantner is also dead, isn't he? Yeah, he died. Um, well, China is a good buddy of my my sister in law where okay. we were staying. Uh, what does China watched, Slick uh, Kantner do? We built the city on rock and roll. So not a good experience. No, it doesn't work for me. I mean, I'm more of an airplane guy, if anything. But anyway, Jefferson airplane or like just yeah, being on airplanes. Anything, <laughs> I don't like music. It's like that, airplanes. More of a hijacking kind of guy. Uh, I'm more of an SR-71. You'd be a great hijacker guy. in like a 74 plane hijacking. Yeah. I, I, I'm I surprised do you don't like get more parts really, like that. I'm going for the low key hijacker. For those of you who can't see Gordo because podcasting is a auditory medium, he resembles a in his prime Peter Fonda. Peter mixed Fonda. Mixed with a little bit of Mac Tonight. <laughs> Christ, is that? Is that <laughs> I don't remember Mac tonight. Is that, to is that a McDonald's? That oh, wait, people. is that the moon shaped McDonald's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. You I'm might only, remember from your last nightmare. <laughs> I'm only accusing you of that because people used to accuse me of looking like Mac tonight in high school. See, because I have a large chin. 
And Gordo has a very prominent chin. Uh, where were we? Oh, yes, ranting. <laughs> okay, so I, wait, well, I was did, going to rave. So <laughs> Grace, Slick, Grace licensed, Slick licensed a song to Chick-fil-A. Now, you mean a Jefferson Starship song or an sure, airplane song? Sure, yeah. We, I don't know. Which What's one is um, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now from Starship, no, uh, which formerly known as Jefferson now. Starship. That's a terrible formerly song. Formerly known it as is Jefferson just, Airplane and presumably before you know, that. Okay, I so 70-year-olds dancing to that Did something go wrong? As you may or may not know, Chick-fil-A is known not only for having delicious chicken, but, but for also being politics. notoriously anti-civil rights. And during the Grammys, there was a commercial played for Chick-fil-A uh, with Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now. And uh, people were like, hey, did Grace Slick disappoint us in the way that some 60s people like Peter Fonda yeah. and Mo Tucker and go crazy? Uh, but no, as it turns out, she had a, an editorial in Forbes today where she explained uh, why she did it. Because For she, the money. End well, of editorial. Then she gave <laughs> the money to uh, an LGBT organization. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on one second. Did she give the money immediately? The only reason she did it was to then give the money in the way that people donate to like NARAL in Mike Pence's name. Was it like, I'm doing this in order to donate the money? Or once the backlash kicked in, did she decide to donate the money? It was definitely the former. The, what she, what she, what she, so she According writes, to her. In the, in the Forbes editorial, she says, quote, the Georgia-based company has a well-documented history of funding organizations through their philanthropic foundation, Windshape, that are against gay marriage. In interviews, CEO Dan T. Cathy has critiqued gay rights supporters who have the audacity to find marriage and said they are bringing God's judgment upon the nation. I, Grace Slick, firmly believe that men should be able to marry men and women, women. I am passionately against anyone who would try to suppress this basic human right. So my first thought when Chick-fil-A came to me was, fuck no. Then she goes on to say, I am donating every dime that I make from that ad to Lambda Legal, the largest national legal organization working to advance the civil rights of LGBTQ people and everyone living with HIV. Admittedly, it's not the millions that Win Shape has given to organizations that define marriage as heterosexual, but instead of them replacing my song with someone else's and losing this opportunity to strike back at anti-LGBTQ forces, I decided to spend the cash in direct opposition to Chick-fil-A's causes and to make a public example of them too. Don't We're buy it. to take some of their money and pay it back. I don't buy it. Oh, wow. Well, uh, I, have to admit, I loved it because I thought it was like oh, I mean, it's a good story. next level trolling. It's a good story. However, the logic does not hold up. If you don't support what they're for, helping them sell more sandwiches does not help your cause. Because however many yeah. tens of thousands of dollars or even hundred thousand yeah. dollars that they probably paid, it's probably not more than that. They probably sold a hell of a lot more sandwiches than they paid her to license the song. To me, yeah. I'm sorry, as a cynical, jaded 50, well, soon something. to be 50. Something? 50, so, no. I think once you're, once you're 49, you're not a 50-something. No, 50-something yeah, implies like 55 plus. You're 50 somewhere. You're a 50-something. I am a 50-something dude. I am in my 40s. Yeah, you're um, about to hit the wall. However, I can spot a milkshake duck when I see one. I'm uh, calling Grace Slick out. Well, that's like like uh, doing a Nazi propaganda film and then buying a bunch of war bonds, the U.S. war bonds, with the money. Exactly. It's, yeah, 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 but I don't know. I, I mean, Chris, I like your trusting seem... nature, but it just seems a little – like, l let me just say that if that happened, the way she's saying, what – what would have occurred would there would be a viral video that came out which showed the plotting of this brilliantly meta publicity stunt, much in the same way that when Banksy sold his girl with a balloon painting right. for however many millions of dollars, and as the gavel fell, the painting was shredded. After that was revealed, the video came out that showed how they built the shredder into the frame, and this is what we were going to do all along, and your part in this was noting it and having outrage over it. However, this to me sounds a little convenient for Grace Slick to have been called out for something which, by the way, it's, listen, if it's your music and you need the money, you're free to do whatever the hell you need to do to pay the bills. No judgment. It just, I don't buy the story that it was part of some... Ah, perhaps I hear what you're saying. Uh, you're, like you're, said, you're, forever, forever nature. I, you're forever associating your song with that brand, whether you did anything positive with the money or not. Yeah, it's going to outlast negative, any kind of- It doesn't uh, make any sense. Gordo, why don't you call China Slick Cantor and okay, get to the I'm bottom of this <laughs> right now, live on the air. Like, get your mom ass. on the phone. Get, your get her on the fucking phone. <laughs> you can tell when she's lying, right? <laughs> Actually, funny enough, China Slick is like, oh, hey, I just way. got this great new- 
Let me put it to you this way. If Gordon was just with China Slicanter and this whole thing had occurred, don't you think she would have been like, oh, did you hear what this cool publicity stunt my mom did? The reason she didn't mention it is- It's a fabrication. It's a, it's a fabrication. All right, well, you could be right. Like I said, that never crossed my mind. Cool. I, I loved the story, but maybe, Zardos. like you said, it's too- uh, Zardoz wants good. you to believe. All right, what else do you have, Chris, that we can dump on? I guess- <laughs> uh, That'll teach you to have something I know, feel positively well, about actually, this world. <laughs> you got- <laughs> Did you see uh, the pizza guy thing? So at the Cohen testimony yesterday, when somebody was doing a stand-up yeah. news thing, behind him, you see this, this <laughs> um, kid, this congressional officer, like, go to a door, get, like, a pizza box and from some water. And then he's going. And then he sort of stops in the hallways and, like, Has a a slice? A, eats, starts eating the pizza. Then somebody points out to him, like, you are on camera. <laughs> and so he, like, looks and his eyes get wide, uh, which <laughs> I thought was funny and great. But then but there are people, he's already become, like, an internet Celebrity and people are calling him like a legend and like welcome to the resistance. And I was like, like <laughs> I mean, there were people doing actual questioning in <laughs> in the house chambers. I, I think elevating him to legend status, I thought that was a little bit uh a little bit quick. Yeah, it doesn't take much nowadays. Yeah. Well, it's a little premature because obviously the Pizza Gate people will it's all oh, a yeah. coded message, man. <laughs> That's right. That okay. QAnon, it's real. QAnon is real. I saw a QAnon thing the other day from uh, Patton Oswald's wife was, I guess they're being harassed by QAnon for some reason because of a political stance that they took. Hmm. I'm sympathetic to them. I, I, I think Patton Oswald is very funny. However, I also think it's very funny when comedians or celebrities sort of treat being on Twitter as if it's like a, a, a moral sacred right, which we should all rise up and prevent them from being harassed on Twitter. No. Well, I mean, it is the digital town square, isn't but it? But if we got rid of Twitter, Trump would immediately have vastly less influence and and mouth size in the universe. That's the that the whole thing takes place on Twitter for crying out loud. Just shut it down, people. Otherwise, the machines are coming to kill you and me and everyone. Any what any other all for? any <laughs> other raves they have? No, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Uh, I was going to say something about motherhood and apple pie, but forget it. <laughs> Gordo, do you have any rants or raves? Let me tell you about motherhood. <laughs> <laughs> no, for one thing, um, people keep wanting to impeach Trump, right? Which is great, you know, whatever, impeach everybody. But remember how Clinton was impeached mm -hmm. and he was still the president after yes. that? Right. Impeaching does not mean removal from office. There yeah. seems to be a misunderstanding about that. Well, of course, it's 2019, Gordo. Everything's yeah, a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding. Exactly. If we understood- like Poor Grace Slick, there are people who doubt her. <laughs> At least there are people like Chris- with full hearts and good intentions who are willing to believe to a try. cock and bull story that Grace Slick pens <laughs> for a capitalist tool magazine in self-defense. It never crossed my mind that Grace Slick would do that. Seriously? Money. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, there's a lot of delicious chicken sandwiches out there. If you don't want to support Chick-fil-A, go have a Shake Shack chicken sandwich. I it's see it. fucking amazing. I mean, yeah, God. Shake Shack, they're pretty righteous, Shake they're Shack, great. right? I think so, yeah. And you can feel good about well, supporting. They better be. Um, I have a quick rave. Um, it's going to start a bit on a downer, but it actually is a positive message. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the comedian Brody Stevens. Yeah, yeah. Um, who, the week I was out there, he killed he, himself. He killed right? himself. Oh, no. Um, someone that people refer to as a comedian's comedian in that mm -hmm. he had some success. He had a TV show briefly on Comedy Central. He had some stand-up specials, but he's really primarily known uh, as a comedy store guy and a universally beloved comedian in Los Angeles. I didn't know him. I didn't really know his work that well, but he uh, committed suicide. And among the many outpourings of support and reminiscence of him, there is a really extraordinary video on the website, All Things Comedy, where he had a podcast, which was called The Festival of Friendship. And his producer did like a four and a half hour tribute to Brody who was a very Andy Kaufman-esque kind of meta comedian. And I think that's why he was beloved by real working comedians, because they understood that what he was doing on stage didn't always work. And Brody Stevens is one of those comics. It's almost more fascinating and fun to watch him bomb mm -hmm. than it is to watch him kill. Because when it's not going right, which would be a fairly frequent occurrence given the nature of his standup could turn confrontational in a moment if the audience was not giving him the same positivity with which he took the stage. And he had catchphrases, he had a very distinct cadence. He often not so much turned on the audience, but he would prop himself up by telling them what a good guy he was and basically saying that they should reward his positivity mm -hmm. that he's giving them with the positivity that he requires. So he's always kind of doing a tightrope. And anyway, on this long podcast, about four and a half hours, 50 or 60 comedians come in pairs and take the microphone for just five 
five minutes each and tell funny stories about Brody Stevens. And in addition to just kind of telling you something about someone you may not know about, in the sense that like a working actor is a real actor that you may not have heard of, this guy was a real working comedian who had the ultimate respect. It's hard to imagine almost any comedian getting the reaction that was given to him on this podcast. And um, I found it just really actually kind of uh, joyful to, to celebrate and hear stories about him and hear jokes that he told. Um, and there's a great stand-up clip you can look for, which is from the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival in Montreal in 2013. It's a nine minute clip and he does not go over well, but it's fascinating to watch him command the stage regardless of the fact that the Canadians just don't get him uh -huh. at all. Is that the one where he says to the audience, uh, and if you don't get that, you're just dumb. That's, it's not that one. That's a famous clip, but he does tell a joke that doesn't land during this performance. And he goes, that's a good joke. I'm staying with that joke. <laughs> and years from now, you're going to realize that was a good joke and you will get it then. And that's okay. <laughs> um, anyway, just look him up. He's an interesting guy. And that podcast is kind of fascinating. It's fascinating just to watch comedians uh, sharing emotions with each other. I love comedians. So you get to see every different thing. There's actually like one comedian calls in and uses this opportunity to trash another comedian for something that has nothing to do with the guy at yeah. all. And then like two hours later, the other guy calls in and the host is like, so uh, man, I'm so sorry. I know you were close to Brody. Uh, you know, it, listen, the mic is yours. Yeah. Did so-and-so call up and trash me? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. That's the lowest life thing. And the guy's like, uh, okay, we got to keep moving. Rare and amazing to see a community kind of pull together and a community that's usually as riddled with factions and fracture as comics are. Right. Because there's, everybody's worried about who, whoever, where is everybody else? Where, where's your credits versus my credits? All this kind of stuff. Um, Which he made fun of that all the time. He made fun of that all I the time. I am show business. Yeah. He was, I was he, in The Hangover, <laughs> Hangover 2. Yeah, he has a famous bit where he said he was in Hangover, Hangover 2. Wasn't in Hangover 3, though. Not sure what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's Rant Let's move on to Headlines. Headlines. Gordo, this is the part of the show where I read some interesting recent entertainment headlines and get your and Chris's reactions. Are you ready to get hmm. the first one? Shoot. Okay. Great. Opium addicted parrots keep raiding poppy farms in India. Have you heard this story? No. Really? <laughs> it was all over, Mike. Wow. Really? No. Well, Grace Slick licensed a song. <laughs> no. uh, She's going to give it all to the parrot <laughs> to rehab. Poppy farmers are being forced to guard their crops against the drug addled birds who get high off the narcotic effects of the plant. So apparently in India, uh, these parrots are eating uh, the poppy seeds or the poppy plants, and have become junkies, junkie parrots. That's a great idea for a stage musical. You yeah. can take that. Um, Go, one poppy take it now. All right, I'm gone. One poppy flower gives around 20 to 25 grams of opium. But a large group of parrots feeds on these plants around 30 to 40 times a day. And some even fly away with poppy pods. They've been trying firecrackers, loud noises, but nothing has helped. Who will compensate us for our losses, say the poppy farmers? Oh, fuck you parrots, mean? man. I don't know. I never liked him. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> keep talking, talking back. And talk. Okay. Well, listen, if you're so cavalier about animal life, let's see how you feel about humans after I read you the next headline. Go right ahead. Man accused of dipping testicles in customer's salsa. This is a Tennessee delivery man who was jailed after he was filmed himself dipping his testicles into a container filmed of salsa himself. that yeah. a customer had ordered online. He recorded it and posted a video saying, quote, this is what you get when you give an 89 cent tip for an almost 30 minute drive. See, and they're calling the pizza kid a legend, but not this guy. Now, here's where you and yeah, I differ. It's all on how you frame it, you know? <laughs> I'm on team delivery guy. Is that, a, is that a site where people film themselves dipping uh, the <laughs> items? It's not a no, site. No, no, no. He's, he's a, for the delivery guy. Oh, you're guy. on that yeah. actual team. I see. <laughs> I'm on the team, too. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I, this delivery guy drove 30 minutes. You can't tip the guy 89 cents. And if you do that, you're a jerk. And I'm not saying you deserve to have testicle dipped salsa. Well, that should have been a word of mouth thing. Like, don't film yourself doing that. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, yeah, that's- yeah, they brag right alone. Like, I got back at him. This is right. what I did. Don't show. Our next story comes from Berlin. German police say a dead cow kicked a slaughterhouse worker. So the cow was killed according to regulations early Thursday in an abattoir. Abattoir is one of those words that still has a contemporary presence, but sort of evokes it's like, like a- It's haunted. A ha it yeah. sounds what it's like, like a, what it is. killing it's like floor. The cow was killed, hung from a meat hook for processing. Then the carcass kicked the worker in the face, apparently due to a nerve impulse that experts say isn't uncommon. 41-year-old worker was hospitalized. Again, team cow carcass. Yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you a kick in the you're face. Not, you're on the side of the carver? I mean, yeah, it sucks that the guy got kicked in the face. I mean, I, you know, no. I understand the cow. Well, you think, I think it sucks a little back. worse for the cow. Yeah, it would have yeah. been better if the All guy had perished. Now. <laughs> I'm not much of an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth type. Do not. <laughs> and our last story um, just made me laugh. There's a text thread between a daughter and her father. The father was uh, taking a trip in Iceland with his mother, who was an elderly lady. And she uh, took a photo, which I'll show you, uh, posed on a little bit of an iceberg on a seashore, as you can see here. It's made like a little sea chair, adorable photo of Granny on an ice chair. Of course, what happened next was Granny was swept out to sea on the ice chair and and had to be rescued by the Coast Guard. But she was rescued. She was rescued. How far out did she get? Uh, 462 nautical miles. It's a, oh, it's a good thing he got a picture of no, it. No, I'm just kidding. It was, happening. Okay. <laughs> it was just a few, it was just, you know, 20 feet off the ship. <laughs> he was, a- <laughs> she was discovered in green. But I love that Chris's willingness to I believe was, the nautical. Yeah, I was that is a that. very impressive glacier that it did not melt wow. in all that time. Well, it's very cold. <laughs> Grace yes, Slick donated so that money for a good cause. Wow. Yeah. She shaved that down into a snow cone to save the children. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gents. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you very much for Gordo, joining thanks us. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I thank you so much for doing Zardoz and giving it the appreciation it deserves. Well, we're expecting that you are going to spread the word far and wide to the vast Zardoz community. At your next meeting, your next dress up. Do you go to costume parties where people dress up as Zardoz? We draw on the mustache. Yeah. yeah. Right. The, who can get those masks? Do you think that's so Sean's real mustache? That must be, that's a real mustache that he grew. Well, I'm talking about Arthur Frayne's mustache. Oh, Arthur Frayne's mustache. Frayne, yes. yeah. yeah, I bet he grew that. Yeah. Though I think John Borman did say he that did say the, uh, the ponytail is a wig. Yeah. Oh, that's a clip on? Uh, we usually go out on a famous movie quote. And I was thinking, of course, you know, John Borman, he had great success with Deliverance, did this. And then he went back to things like The Tailor of Panama and other more conventional fare. That's a great movie. If you ask him about Zardoz, he might say, You met me at a very strange time in my life. Thanks for listening to Full Cast and Crew. I just wanted to remind everyone to subscribe if you haven't already, so you'll get a new episode every Thursday. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at fullcastandcrewpod at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at at fullcastandcrew, or find us on Facebook.